question you asked about error rates. I think most would agree that that's a huge limiting factor for these applications. And so in our case, what I'll, what I'll talk to you about is when we do work in the area of sending real-time alerts from fixed cameras, from surveillance video, we're trying to target single-digit false alarms per camera per month. And people are used to talking about that per camera per hour. Um, when, we, when, we, when we do this work in um, Grand Central Station, we, we, have a, we have a product that can find firearms and explosives on people as they walk in, concealed or open carry firearms and explosives. When we do that, you're talking about needing three or four or five nines in your, in your, uh, in your, in your accuracy there. So now that I've lost all credibility by saying ridiculous numbers, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll launch in. So I'm Brendan McCord from Evolve Technology, and um, just really quick about me, I have a technical background, but it's in nuclear engineering, and I switched away from that. So I had the privilege of spending 600 plus days underwater on a submarine, and then shifted over, and now I'm in a product role. So I'm the head of product for um, what we call the Evolve Mosaic. Um, so we are a startup in the, in the greater Boston area in Waltham, and I'll tell you about it. I've got a three minute marketing pitch that I'll subject you to and then I'll try to um, win you back with by teeing up some of the some of the really interesting technical problems that we're working on. So it's about security that works in a changing world. And the world we live in is a dangerous place. The fatalities from terrorism are up 900% since the 9-11 levels and we're accelerating on that dimension into 2017. So for people who are charged with keeping us safe, security professionals, they have to innovate more than most in our new normal on the news. And I can't, I can't stand that phrase. The new normal is, is something that would involve long lines at the airport and anywhere else for doing, because we're implementing um, security countermeasures. False alarms, which we just talked about, because the technology, it doesn't pay off um, on the promise of its vision. Miss threats because threats change really fast and, and we move really slow. And then incomplete coverage because security can't be everywhere at once. So it's, it's basically how much longer are we willing to employ this model of more people, more time, and more money. If, you, if any of you know about Inspire Magazine, or you just sort of know what kinds of threats we've seen in the post-ISIS era, you know that it's, it's, a, it's a totally new kind of threat. Airports have been looking at switchblades at aviation checkpoints, and now they're concerned about suicide bombers at the, at the perimeter. So that's the mission. Um, we're kind of coming to an end on the marketing piece. I get to work on it with, a, with an amazing team. The guy on the left, Mike Ellenbogen, founded a company that does the explosive detection for airports today, and built it to 100 million in revenue, sold the company. The guy on the right was the technical lead for the um, Game of Thrones and Star Trek um, mobile games. So a really interesting mix of innovative modern thinking with some deep industry experience, which in this domain is definitely um, necessary. Guy in the middle ran operations for, uh, for TSA. And these are people who work really, really close with us. They're not just the, the kind of typical advisor pictures, and they're the biggest names in security. David Cohen was the guy the pluck from the CIA to go start up that thing at NYPD that you showed with Matt Lauer. Um, John Pistol ran TSA, FBI. So these are these are you know people I get to work really closely with. Security, not complicated. You just have to do these four things, which are really, really hard. You have to monitor your perimeter, you have to find the guns and the bombs, you have to spot the bad guys, and you gotta get intelligence to the front lines. But you have to do it um, while minimizing inconvenience to the public. So we have this human augmented AI approach. I'm gonna spend more time talking about the AI than about the human augmented piece, but that is a really important part of how we think about the problem um, as a combination of, of man and machine so that the operations piece on the side doesn't get any of the noise that they're accustomed to in, in today's systems. So this is, you know, these are the things you have to do well, these are the things that we're working on. Um, I'll just click through these this is a product that's launching in a week and a half, um, but I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about the uh, stuff that's more in early development or mid-development. So this fixed camera, CCTV, you know, next generation analytics. So here are a couple of examples which I hope work. Thankfully they don't have sound. 
All right, so, you know, warehouse type environment, loading dock, whatever. Um, the camera on the right is from the customer who monitors, you know, thousands of, of sites around the country, and they're all really different and really challenging. What What is true of this is, and I'll, So, the top three challenges that, that we deal with in this domain are, one, how do you detect and track objects in video at scale? Two, how do you robustly detect people despite a huge variation? And I say people there because there are a lot of ways to think strategically about how to create a video analytics company. The way we think about it is, we focus on the real-time stuff. We want to be we want to be in a position to give people information that's going to stop a threat, not just provide good forensic data. Um, and then, you know, rather than doing, if you imagine like a Pareto chart, rather than doing the things on the on the long tail, it's the more interesting applications there. We want to do the foundational ones really, really well. So we want to be able to find people where they shouldn't be, people trying to cross a perimeter, whatever you call that perimeter. So. You know, for us, it's, it's about people and vehicles. And then the last thing is make use of this, the salient motion information, which I think, you know, the last question to our previous speaker about implementing some tracking to go along with the faster RCNN, that's, you know, something I'll talk a little bit about here. So we, you know, we've implemented um, faster RCN as well, with VGG16, um, as, as well as another um, related technique that you're probably familiar with, with the single shot multi-box detector, um, which is similar in accuracy to, to faster RCNN. It's about 10 times um, faster. So, you know, this is the object detector. These are the convolutional layers shown that are learning the features that are good for object detection. And you can think about it as being broken up into, into two parts. On the previous slide, it was um, object proposal and object classification. So. In the traditional way of doing this is you could look at every pixel and try to try to say whether there's a person there, or you could jump some pixels and, and look and see whether there's a person there. And you could search across the entire frame and across the scale space to be looking for people. The way the, that um, modern approaches have, have tackled this problem is instead to learn objectness, as I'm sure most, most of you are familiar, and so there's a separate piece, which in faster CNN's case is called the Region Proposal Network, that's trained on detecting objects. And it's not very accurate. It's very high recall. But if you're looking for people in vehicles, um, it's just looking for objects. And so its benefit is that it gives you, you know, a thousand or several hundred or a thousand region proposals, which isn't great, but it's a lot better than dealing with a million pixels. So what Faster RCNN does and why it's very useful for our application, which is all about video analysis at scale, is that it's beautifully allowed the region proposal network to share the convolutional layers with the object classifier. So this is, what, this is the um, approach that we take. And then also, I mentioned we have a, the, the human in the loop um, approach. And so in test mode, an image comes in, goes to the convolutional layers, region proposals are generated, bounding boxes are sent to the object classifier, object classifier does its thing, and if it's at an acceptably high confidence level, we'll send it through to the, to the end user. If it's, if it's at a very low confidence level, we'll reject it. And if it's in the middle, if it's near to some confidence threshold, then we'll send it to a human for to identify whether there's a person in that um, in that scene or not. And obviously, the, the question you ask the person is, is um, the, there's a lot of flexibility in that step. But that allows us that allows the customer to not get the false alarms. It allows the system to be able to handle a range of interesting use cases, and it allows us to annotate those hard examples for which the classifier was not confident, so that those can be fed back into the training set for continuous improvement. So we can update this on a weekly basis, for example, using hard examples from the field based on this human no loop process. So the next, next piece of this is um, 
the huge variation. And I think, I don't have anything new to say on this subject, but for fixed camera scenes, this is a pretty good um, example. So person on a bicycle at a, at a, at a strange angle, s similar kind of thing, but the person presenting a, weird, a strange pose. This is in um, Boston for, a, for a, a project that we did where there's a crowd. It looks similar to the scenes from the, from the last speaker. So resolution is a big challenge, and um, it is hard to, to discern people from cylindrical objects if the camera has low resolution or if the person is too far in the field of view. Color is challenging. There's grayscale and there's color, and the gamut of colors is, is, is challenging the, the, the way in which the cameras reproduce the colors. So we don't have any control over the camera, the, the placement and configuration of the camera, or the scene, obviously. Um, if you control those pieces, you can, you can take some of those variables out of the equation, but we think it's a lot more valuable to be able to work with a wide range of, of customer hardware. And we don't think anybody needs to buy new cameras. There are almost 300 million of them in the, in the world today, so people can just refresh as they, as they see fit. Um, other things, I mean, lighting challenges, again, there, there's, a, there's a huge range of of challenges and the variation. The last piece here for this problem is how do you make use of the salient motion information? So I hope that I've laid out this slide in a, in a decent way. Um, but what I'm trying to show here is that there are a couple of different tracking um, methods that, that have to be invoked, or at least that we've, that we've worked on. So there's the background subtraction and foreground isolation one where you can use a Gaussian mixture model and you can pay attention to only those things which are you know, foreground isolated. And that is a, that's kind of the, the traditional way of doing that. There's also tracking by repeated detection where if you have a good, um, a good classifier that's generating a lot of bounding boxes successively then we can track using the information on those bounding boxes. I'm showing simple and online real time tracker or sort. Um, there's also Markov decision processes that we looked at. And what, what, we're, what we're doing is we're employing a combination of the two because if you detect a person, I'll show an example of this, but if you detect a person on frame 30, but then you don't detect them on that on a few frames, and then you get them again on frame 35, you want to be able to use the motion information that existed from in the middle there to be able to augment the region proposal network. And, and so you kind of have to you know, use a combination of these, these two. So we're still, we're still working on it and figuring, figuring this out. We've got it implemented, this combination, and it's working, it's working pretty well. So here's an example where this is only faster RCNN, and you can see that it's getting some detections on this person. Um, and then here's, I think I might crash my computer if I launch all these at once. But here's where you can see that it's, it's now employing both techniques and it's smoothing it out and it's, provi it's providing that tracking. Um, this also allows for a multi-stage process. So, Somebody asked earlier about what's being done locally, what's being done um, on the server. So we're cloud focused, and our software is cloud capable. We can we can run it locally, we can run it in the cloud. But bandwidth is a huge, huge issue for people. So you have to be able to work with very few frames. You have to be event driven, and you have to when you're when you're. It's it's good to be able to do a first stage um, bit of work that's very high recall at the customer site. So we can kind of pluck off this top piece there, which is a very high recall blob detector, and we can only send information from that um, to this, you know, augmenting the RPN, um, and so forth. All right, so really quickly, this is a, a, another technology we're working on that we're launching in a couple of weeks, and it's exciting because it's the only thing that can detect uh, firearms and explosives, metallic or non-metallic, and you can just walk straight through and you can keep your cell phone, your wallet, um, your keys and everything on you. So this is a lot more mature, um, and it also has some pretty interesting machine learning um, computer vision components here. 
So I'll just tee these up to kind of tantalize is not the word, but um, but so the, the top challenges in this are how do you make use of the physics information here? So how do you make use of the phenomenology? Where we operate, it's a um, massively multi-static synthetic aperture radar um, type approach that operates in the 24 to 30 gigahertz range. So it's millimeter wave data that's coming back and we set it up so that we can get cross-pole and co-pole information, get a lot, it's fully coherent. And it's, it's a really interesting data platform, or data generating device. And so there's a lot of good stuff there and a lot of members of our team have, um, I don't know if you've seen this article about small data um, that I think Jan LeCun wrote, but it's about, it says, you know, for small data problems, a lot of these folks have walked in the shoes of the physicists and, and folks like that, and they, they, they understand kind of what the specialist knowledge here is. So it's about how do you, how do you take that, that artful crafting of features and apply the deep learning techniques that work super well um, while, while maintaining that. So that kind of covers one and two, and then unique and multimodal. So we have a few different sensors that give us different information in that platform. We take some of them together. There, there are some interesting things we could do with, with a future version of this, and so I'd love to get ideas on this. This is just to give you an example. It's suicide bombs, it's you know stuff like that, and this is pulse response for a few different types of materials. This is angular and pulse response on the left for anomalies. So, you know, it's an interesting interesting data set that and we've built a hardened algorithm and we this would be about how do you make it better? Um, how do you make it all work faster and better? So, last slide is, um, you know, we sponsored this event and uh, it's because we're, we're, we're growing and we want to talk about what we're doing and we also want to um, add some brilliant people to our team. So, we are, um, so I think, I think the things that, that stand out as mattering to, to someone, to, to your friend who is looking for um, something and, and you can refer is the tech stack is really interesting, modern high performance from a software engineering standpoint and from an AI standpoint. It's, it's really unique stuff. The second is the team is wonderful. I showed some of the more, some of the business types and the security types, but the engineering team is is wonderful. Um, we're backed by Bill Gates, General Catalyst, and Lux Capital, and we are just raising another round, so we'll, we haven't announced um, publicly that, but these are folks who have transformed industries and who are, who are visionaries, the, the, the venture team as well, so it's all around a really good ecosystem. And then it's a, it's a really meaningful mission. I, I truly believe that. Security really sucks today, and the mission of keeping people safe, trying to do it in a, in a better way, is something that um, you know I find pretty motivating. So that's all I have. Here's my my contact information. Thank you.